Merry Christmas here at Airline Baptist Church. We're so delighted and glad that you're here today. And uh, we want to welcome all those that are watching us online. Also, those that will be watching us uh, in the family, uh, in the uh, main auditorium today at 11. 11. Let's give them a warm Air Lake Baptist Church welcome. Let them know that you're out there and you love them and you're praying for them. And uh, we're delighted you're here. I want to remind you, of course, we've got two really, really exciting things that are happening. Don't forget uh, this coming uh, Christmas Eve at uh, 4 and at 6. We have Christmas Eve service. It's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. It's going to have a lot of great elements to it. And it's fun for the whole family. And it's going to be very meaningful uh, as we light our candles together. And uh, just, just remember uh, that Jesus is the reason for the season. Do I have anybody who believes that today? Say a big amen. Amen. And so uh, that's Christmas Eve, 4 and 6, in the Family Life Center. Also, next Sunday, one service right here in this auditorium, in the main auditorium, at 10 o'clock next Sunday. Uh, no Tiny Town, no, no Norris Park, no children's ministry. Bring your family, bring the kids, uh, have one-hour service together, and uh, let them worship with you. It'll be great. 10 o'clock in this auditorium next Sunday morning, uh, one, one, one worship service together. No Sunday school, small groups, or anything like that. All right. So uh, now we're in this uh, we're in this series called uh, uh, Rediscover Christmas, and uh, today we kind of finish it up. Uh, we're talking about the big and the, you know the, the great things of Christmas, the epic things of Christmas, and and I know Christmas is about little tiny baby Jesus being born in Bethlehem, but Christmas is big. Christmas is huge. Uh, Christmas is epic. Uh, Christmas changed everything. How many of you believe that? today. And so we, we talked about, we talked about rediscovering some of those big, great things about Christmas. We talked about this rediscovering hope and how everybody needs hope, man. And the great message of Christmas is hope, rediscovering trust, uh, trust in the Lord, trust in his word. Uh, and then we talked about last time, rediscovering worship and uh, talking about the wise men and, you know, falling down before Jesus and worshiping him. Christmas is all about that. Today, we're going to talk about belief. We're going to talk about rediscovering your belief. And today we're really going to talk about what Christmas is all about in the area of theology, believe it or not, in the area of belief. And so I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 1. And we're going to be beginning at verse 18. Now, I could, uh, I, I could read this like I've read it a hundred other times before you. And it's always special. How many, how many of you know you can, you know, every time you read the Word of God, it's, it's special. But uh, I can read that. Like, but I, I wanted to kind of do it a little different. I, I want this to have a little bit of impact on you. So I'm not going to read it today. Uh, but uh, I have uh, asked Luke and Sarah Beth Dickerson uh, to read this passage for you. And it'll bless you. Check this out. mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. She sent Joseph, her husband, to think her through the law, and yet did not want to expose her to his mother's disgrace. He had an idea to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Great. Man, praise the Lord for that. And um, so, uh, you know, there's nothing like kids at Christmas. And I almost started to have everybody wear your pajamas today. But anyway, uh, yeah, that would, no, we didn't do that. But, uh, but, you know, you see it all around. You see it all over the place. And I guess the, uh, the remake of Miracle on 34th Street, the, the new remake, which is not bad, by the way. I really, I really kind of like it. Uh, but you see it all around. You see it, you know, on people's walls. And, and you see the word, I believe. I believe. And, and it's all over the place. And we kind of we know and kind of expect what people, uh, what they mean by that uh, when they say, I believe. And, uh, but more or less, they, I believe in Santa Claus, or, I, you know, I, I believe in the spirit of Christmas and all that. But what I want to do today is uh, kind of share with you, first person, uh, me, what I believe about Christmas. And I hope you believe the same thing about Christmas as well. Just in the very, the very terminology, the very word Christmas is Christ. 
Uh, the word Christ, of course, is the Greek word for anointed, the anointed one. And then Christmas, mass, is a Latin word which talks about celebration. So how many of you know that Christmas really is the celebration that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and all God's people said? And that is, that's what Christmas is all about. And I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. Now, I want us to go back to Matthew chapter 1. And, uh, and I want us to begin at verse 22. And listen, listen uh, and uh, Luke and Sarah Beth already read this. But listen, so all this was done, that it might be fulfilled when it was spoken to the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Manuel, which is translated God with us. Everybody say, God with us. God with us. And we've read it a hundred times. Now, what prophet is he talking about? He, talk, he talks about the prophet saying this, but this is before Matthew came along. This is before Jesus was born. What prophet he's talking about? Of course, he's talking about the prophet Isaiah. So take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah, uh, just for a moment. Uh, and um, let, me, let me give you a little background while, while you look at Isaiah chapter 7. Ahaz was the king of Judah. Now, Ahaz was not a, a good king of Judah. Uh, he was a wicked king of Judah, and Judah had good kings and bad kings. Judah is the area where uh, the temple was and where Jerusalem was. And so Ahab was the king of Judah, and the king of Syria uh, was attacking or going to attack Judah. Now, God raises up a prophet named Isaiah, and Isaiah comes along to encourage Ahaz and let him know that Judah is not going to be destroyed, that, that God is going to watch over uh, Judah. And so in order for him to know that, in order for him to know that Isaiah is telling the truth, he asks Ahaz, the king, he says, ask for a sign. Ask for a sign and see if God won't do what you ask to seal, uh, you know, th to make sure that you understand that God is not going to let Syria destroy the kingdom of Judah. So ask for a sign. So, so now Ahaz says, well, he said, I'm not going to test the Lord. Now, on the surface, that sounds spiritual, doesn't it? On the surface, he said, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to test the Lord. And on the surface, it sounds real spiritual, but the bottom line is, that's not spiritual at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, what Isaiah doesn't know uh, is that Ahaz, the king, has already made a deal with Assyria. And he's already told Assyria, he said, you come in and you take our land and take us as captives. And he did that to save his own neck. In other words, Assyria had promised, listen, we won't kill everybody uh, in Judah, and, and especially you, Ahaz, we'll, we'll spare your life. So to save his own neck, he's already made a behind-the-closed-doors deal with the king of Assyria. Not Syria, but Assyria. And so, uh, so, so Isaiah doesn't, doesn't know this, and so it sounds on that perfect, you know, you know Ahaz is saying, you know what, I, I don't want to test the Lord. Sounds like a spiritual thing. And the bottom line, I hear people say this all the time. Maybe even some of you said, you know people that have said this. Say, well, you know what, I just don't want to bother God. You hear people say, oh, you know what, I don't want to bother God. God's got his hands full, you know, with Washington and all that. Can I get an amen? I mean, you know, and so I just don't want to bother God. And that sounds real spiritual. Bless your spiritual heart that you don't want to bother God. Bless your heart that you got needs in your life and you say, you know what, God, you got your hands full of everybody else. I'll handle this on my own. And what you don't understand is that's not blessing God's heart and that's not spiritual. Jesus came and died so that you can take your request and your burden to him so that he can solve them for you. And all God's people say, Amen. but I hear people say, well, I just don't want to bother God. God's got his hands full. That's not spiritual at all. And so Ahaz is saying the same thing. He said, man, I, I just don't want to bother. I, I don't want to bother God. And the reason why a lot of people say that is because they really don't believe that God's going to come through. The reason why a lot of people don't ask for a sign is they really deep down believe God's not going to come through. So why bother and why ask? So Isaiah says, okay, you won't ask for a sign. I'll give the sign. I'll ask for a sign. God is going to give you a sign that is so audacious and so unbelievable that it's going to be almost next to impossible to believe. And it is a sign that people still today have a tough, tough time wrapping their mind around it. It is a sign today that kind of separates the men from the boys. It kind of separates the believers from the non-believers. 
Uh, it, it is a sign today that so many people have trouble with, especially in the Christmas story. And Isaiah knew that this was a near impossible sign to believe. And what Isaiah says, okay, this is a sign God's going to give. A virgin is going to conceive. Not a young maid, but a virgin. Somebody has never known a man, somebody's never had sex with a man, that virgin is going to conceive. Let's look at it, let's read it. Isaiah chapter 7, beginning at verse 11. He said, ask for a sign for yourself for the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz says, I'll not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he, Isaiah, said, now hear, O heavens of David, is it a small thing for you to be weary, men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, now, nobody said, the Lord himself. This is impossible. And, And all of the naysayers and all the people that try to disprove the virgin birth, don't get upset with them. Obviously, it's absolutely impossible. And that's why he said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, everybody look up here and listen. Right? How in the world did that sign have anything to do with Ahaz? Because this didn't take place until over 700 years after Isaiah had given this sign. So how in the world is that going to bless Ahaz? What in the world is that going to do for Ahaz in the day and the time in which he lived when Messiah was not going to come for 700 years later? Well, I'll tell you how it blessed Ahaz. Because Isaiah was saying, listen, Ahaz, you know that Messiah is going to come through the land of Judah. Messiah is going to come through the house of David. And God is giving you a sign and letting you know that even in the future that Judah is going to be protected, that Messiah is going to come to Judah, so Judah is not going to come to harm. Isaiah is telling Ahaz, Ahaz, understand this, Judah is part of the family of God, and God is not going to let his family fall. I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, if you're connecting the dots or not, but I want to tell you something. Years ago, I became a part of the family of God. Do I have anybody here today that's part of the family of God? Amen? And I'm telling you right now, ladies and gentlemen, because you are a part of the family of God, understand this. We win. And God is not going to let harm befall his people. And at the end of the day, we win. And Jesus is Lord. Jesus never fails. Somebody say amen. Amen? Amen? And we need to understand that. And that's part, you say, well, preacher, how in the world can you be so sure? I'll tell you how I can be so sure. I'll tell you how I know we're on the winning side. I'll tell you how I know that we win. I'll tell you how I know that Jesus is Lord and that there's going to be peace in the Middle East and Jesus is going to be the one that brings it. I'll tell you how I know this as much as I'm standing here, not because I'm a Baptist and not because I'm a preacher. Let me tell you how I know it exactly beyond a shadow of a doubt. Because years ago, a virgin conceived God. God did it, and he did it then as a sign, not only for uh, for Ahaz 700 years before, but also for Jeff Eisenhower and everybody everybody that's in this room today. Jesus is going to rule and reign on this earth, and the reason why I know it is because a virgin conceived just like God said it would, and it happened exactly like God said it would. And all God's people say it. Amen. That's right. Isn't that good? Merry Christmas to us. That's how I know it. That's how I know it. God said, listen, it's an impossible sign. The naysayers, well, you know, I have a problem with that. Yeah, I know. I don't blame you. I have a problem with it too, but it hadn't been from God. It's absolutely impossible. Well, there are two truths very quickly that you and I must believe if we're going to really get anything out of the Christmas story. You see, there's more to it, much more to it than little baby Jesus born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin. That sounds sweet, and maybe you say that, and it just kind of rolls off your lips, and you don't really think about exactly what that means. Or maybe in the back of your mind, you don't think she was a real virgin. Maybe you think she was a young maid or young girl like some translators insist that we say. And so there are two truths that you absolutely have to believe. Now, what I'm going to do is I share these two truths. I'm going to do it in the first person. I'm, I'm going to do it first person singular. I'm, I'm going to tell you what I believe. And, and I don't know if what I believe is what you believe. 
But I'm going to share with you what I believe about Christmas because I believe in Christmas. And I want to tell you why. And I hope you share the same belief. But if you don't, I hope you would examine what I'm saying. And that Christmas will mean a little bit more to you than just this silent night that we just kind of celebrate once a year out of tradition. That you really look and examine what it is we're really celebrating. So I'm going to kind of share with you first person what I believe. First of all, I just got two things I'm going to share. First of all, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the virgin birth. Let me tell you why. Because the virgin birth means that Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God. Now you say, well, Pastor, is that important? Not only is it important, ladies and gentlemen, it's vital. It's absolutely. Now you didn't, you didn't have to understand that when you became a believer. I, I didn't understand all of that when I became a believer. I, I, just, I, just, I just knew that I was a sinner and I needed a Savior. And I didn't understand all the theology behind it. I mean, you know, when I was first saved, man, I'm t- I knew nothing. I was ignorant. I was ignorant about the Bible. I mean, I pronounced Psalms, <coughs> Psalms. Job, I pronounced Job. I, I'm not kidding you. I thought, when I looked at the book of Job, Job, I thought, isn't it cool? God tells you how to get a job in the book of Bible. I mean, you know, it was a job. You know, I thought John 3, 16 was a bathroom on third floor somewhere. Can't get me. I mean, you know, so, so, so I, I knew absolutely nothing. So I didn't have to fully understand that. But as I, but as I trusted and I believed it and God revealed and showed me, then I believe that it's absolutely must. I believe in the virgin birth is important. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Go back to Matthew chapter 1 and look at verse 18. Listen, and the Bible is explicit about this. And this is why uh, Mary was an absolute virgin. Verse 18, Matthew 1. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 20. Joseph, son of David. Do not be afraid to take and marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The the only way, the only way that Jesus could be born God. And in this amazing, amazing plan, a man could not, listen, listen, forget this business of man writing the Bible. Man on his best day could not have come up with a plan like the salvation plan. And all God's people said. And, And how brilliant it is from God Almighty that he never had to compromise his holiness and that he could redeem mankind, but it was only one way to do it, only one possible way, and that is that he himself had to come. But if he's going to die for our sin, he had to come as the perfect sacrifice. He had to come with, with, with no human nature within him, the sinful nature that you and I carry from our parents, Adam and Eve. And the only way to do that is that God had to conceive in him through the Holy Spirit that God is his father and an earthly mother is his mother. And it's the only way that could, that could happen. And we read about it all the time. Go down to verse 23. Behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. Everybody, uh, those that are worshiping in the main auditorium on, 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 uh, uh, in, uh, on the film, everybody say it together. God with us. Say it one more time. God with us. Listen, you know what that means? That doesn't mean God just sent somebody to represent us. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that he is, you know, just a God-like person. It doesn't mean that he's even a godly person. It doesn't mean that he's a representative of God or a guide to God. It was God himself. Born of a virgin, God left heaven's glory to become our Savior, and it wasn't a representative, it wasn't a godly man, it wasn't a guru, it wasn't a God, it was God himself. And all God's people say, isn't that awesome? For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest amount. That he gave the greatest act. His only begotten son, the greatest gift. That whosoever, the greatest opportunity, believes the greatest simplicity. In him, the greatest attraction. Should not perish the greatest promise. But the greatest difference had the greatest certainty 
everlasting life, the greatest possession. I believe that. Does anybody here believe that? In order to get the epic and the great and the bigness and the grandeur of Christmas, you got to understand, he was born of a virgin because that made him fully God. The second thing that will make Christmas epic and big, the way God intended for it to be, and life-changing, the way God intended for it to be, is the second thing. I believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. I believe that Jesus is God. I don't believe that Jesus is one way to heaven or, or a way to heaven. I believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. I don't believe that Jesus came to shed light. I believe Jesus is the light. I don't believe that Jesus is one way to God. I believe that Jesus is God. And he came into place. And by the way, this is where Christmas gets real. This is what separates. This is is why the battle rages. This is why we have a war on Christmas today. Because of this one fact. Now, nobody has a war on a baby being born in a manger. Nobody has a war on the fact that Jesus was a good prophet or a good man or even a martyr. Nobody cares about that. But, man, when you Christians, when you believers, when y'all start saying Jesus is beyond a prophet, Jesus is beyond a man, that Jesus is the God-man, the world has problems with that. And all God's people say That's why, listen, listen, that's why, that's why nobody's going to wish you a Merry Christmas. It has Christ in it. Why are you getting so upset over that? Because the world has a real problem. The world has no problem. Jesus has been a good man. The world has no problem at all. Jesus being kind and being good. You'll hear the world quote that all the time. Well, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus loves everybody. The world has no problem with that. The world has no problem saying that Jesus was real. The world has no problem saying Jesus died on the cross. The world has no problem believing that Jesus was a martyr. The world has no problem putting Jesus on the same level as Muhammad or Joseph Smith or some other religious figure. The world has no problem with that. The world has a problem with this part. Jesus was fully God and at the same time he was fully man. Look, look, look what the Bible says. Look at Matthew chapter 16. By the way, this is a debate that was going on in Jesus' day. This is, this is not a new debate. This was going on in Jesus' day. Look at Matthew 16, beginning at verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. And when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's just another way, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of saying, you know, I, the Son of Man, the God-man, who, who am I, you know? In other words, he said, what's the word on the street? Now, not, not about me being the carpenter's son. Not, not about me being from Nazareth. That, that's not what I'm asking. What's the word on the street about me going around telling everybody that I'm the son of man? I'm the son of God. I'm the son of man. What's the word on the street? In other words, what's the word on the street me going around saying I'm the God man? What are, what are they saying? Well, in verse 14. And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. In other words, they're saying, well, people, it's just what people today, this is nothing new. What people today say, well, you know, they say you're a good man, you're a good teacher, nobody ever taught like you. You, you bring some interesting ideas to the table. You know, we, we believe you're going about doing good, you're a good man, you're doing some good stuff, you're saying some good stuff. That's what people are saying about you. But here's the deal breaker. This is what separates men from the boys. This is, this is what separates those of you that just, you know, celebrate Christmas as a tradition as compared to some of us today that honestly believe all this stuff and honestly believe what the Christmas is all about. Here's the deal breaker. Right? Because in verse 15, Jesus looked at those disciples and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? What do you believe? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And by the way, Peter wasn't the only one that said that. Look at, look at John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Look at verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Bible says, and the Word, that's just another description for Jesus. He's called the Word of God. And the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace 
and truth. You see here, ladies and gentlemen, people will believe everything about Christmas except that one thing. And that's why people are not going to wish you a Merry Christmas. Because when we talk about Christ and Christmas, we're talking about the anointed one. We're talking about a celebration of the anointed Messiah of God, whose name is Jesus. He is Jesus the Christ. He is the Savior of the world. He is the God-man, perfect and sinless in every way, but he is God. And all God's people say and the world has a real problem with that. And I'm not making this up. Listen, listen, listen what, listen what John said in his epistle of 1 John. Listen to this, 1 John chapter 4. Now go all the way toward the book of Revelation. Go all back toward, now some, some of these books are hard to find. But look in the little short letter of 1 John, not the gospel of John. 1 John chapter 4. And look at verse 2. By this you shall know. The Spirit of God. Now, no, by what? Well, he's going to tell us by what. By, by what? By what do you know the Spirit of God? Listen, by this. That every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. I'm going to tell you something. You believe that? Your mama didn't tell you that. If you honestly believe that, your daddy didn't tell you that. If you honestly believe that, some Baptist didn't tell you that. If you honestly believe that, there's only one person that told you that, and his name is the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're relying on what mama told you and you're relying on what daddy told you and you're relying on what some Baptist told you or you're relying on your catechism or your confirmation, you missed the mark. I'm telling you the only person that can stand up here or sit out there or, t or, or in this world that can say, I know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is somebody that the Holy Spirit of God has revealed that to. And all God's people say that. And if you honestly know that, don't ever say God's never spoke to you. He had to speak to you or you would have never got there in the first place. If you're agreeing with this sermon today, I'm telling you, don't ever walk out of here and say, well, God's never spoke to me. Yeah, he did. He calls you to say amen to this rant and raving I'm doing. And all God's people say, amen. This is weird. Listen, what we do, what we do in this place is weird. It's absolutely weird. You're weird. I know I'm weird. I told you about the lady one time and said, you're a nut. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was standing in line. As I was 24 years old. I didn't have the sense that God gave an animal cracker. I just knew Jesus, knew my life had been radically changed. Started, started a church in Powhatan, Virginia. You don't know where Powhatan, Virginia is. The Holy Spirit barely knows where Powhatan, Virginia is. I stand in a little country store. A lady turned around. She went, you, you, you. I said, that's me. She said, I know who you are. You're, you're, that, you're that young preacher that's coming to this town, and you're, and you're telling everybody that your, only your people are the only ones going to heaven. I said, ma'am, that's not true. Half of our people ain't even going to make it. <laughs> I really did. I said. And then she said, you're a nut. I said, that may be, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. Can I get an amen? Amen? I mean, you know, that's right. So listen. So. Listen to what he said. He said, the only way you can know this is the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, the God-man, is not of God. I, I, don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger. I'm telling you. All those good people out there, those well-meaning people out there, those sincere people out there, if they don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh, that he's the God-man, the Spirit of God doesn't dwell in them. Listen to what he said. He carries it on further. I didn't say this. This is, this is, I'm just reading it. These are the words of Jesus. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming. And is now already in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in an antichrist world. We live in an antichrist country. 
I said, well, whatever happened to America being a Christian nation? Because America's never been a Christian nation. I mean, America's been more Bible-friendly than it's ever been. You know, America was leaning toward, you know, the, 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 at least the Judeo-Christian ethic. But there's never been a time when everybody in America was a believer in Jesus Christ. This world, Jesus said, listen, Jesus said, in this world they hate me, they're going to hate you. Because this world is an anti-Christ world. And this world's not going to wish you a Merry Christmas. And this world's going to come up with everything but Christmas. Happy holiday, winter solstice. I mean, every, listen, I heard that there's a town, I think it's in Minnesota somewhere, they have banned poinsettias out of their town because a red poinsettia is, is, is a symbol of Christmas. God help us. And I don't know about you, but I find myself yelling at the TV. I find myself going, this world is absolutely nuts. Have we gone off our rocker? Has America lost their sense? And then the Holy Spirit of God tells me, yes, they've lost their sense. They're blind. And why are you fussing at a blind man for being blind? Why don't you just get out there, Jeff Eisenhower, and win some of them to Jesus? Amen? Amen. That's right. Not going to stop me from wishing somebody Merry Christmas. But I'm not taking back when they don't. I'm not taking back when your children's Christmas program is just a winter musical. What do you expect? What Jesus just said is an Antichrist world. What do you expect? It's because, listen, only the Holy Spirit of God is going to reveal to you that he's fully God and he's fully man. And listen, listen, listen. listen. And if you agree with that today, when the pastor gets up and says, you know, Jesus was all God and Jesus was all man and that he was born of a virgin, he's the God man, and you shake your head like so many of you are doing in agreement with that, do you not understand what kind of blessing that is? Can, do you not understand how privileged you and I are that the Holy Spirit of God one day in our life, even if we were little children, one day in our life, he revealed that to us. And all God's people say, What a blessing. You see, if he were not fully man, then he wouldn't have died. And if he didn't die, then he couldn't have paid for our sin. And if we were not fully God, he couldn't have rose from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Do you see? He had to be both. And bless God, Jesus is both. And nobody else can make that claim. That's why I believe in Christmas. And all God's people say it. It's amazing. Yes. Suppose this happened. This didn't happen. But suppose this happened. Suppose Adam was not anywhere near Eve when Eve took the fruit and disobeyed God. And suppose right after that happened, God in the cool of the day approached Adam and said, Adam, I got some bad news for you. And Adam said, what, God? He said, you know that bride, that woman I made for you? I said, yeah, well, God, thank you. And God said, Adam, she messed up. She disobeyed me. And she's going to have to die. Can imagine how Adam's heart would have been broken had that happened. That didn't happen, but let me tell you exactly what did happen. One day, the father approached the son and said, Jesus, you know that bride I've been making for you on earth? The one that is going to worship you and fellowship with you. And Jesus says, yes, Father, thank you. Thank you for creating them. And God says, Jesus, they messed up. And they're going to have to die. And Jesus, in his grace and his mercy and his glory, said, Father, don't let that happen. If somebody's got to die, let it be me. 
so that my bride can live forever. That's Christmas. And I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that everybody deserves to hear that at least once in their life. That's why we do the different things we try to do. That's why we try several modes of evangelism, several styles of singing and worshiping, because everybody's not cookie cutter. And everybody doesn't connect with Jesus the same way. But the message that Jesus is the God-man, fully God, to be your sacrifice and mine, and fully man, to die, and fully God to raise from the dead, that's for everybody. And whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I believe that. I'd like for us all to stand, if we would. I want the camera just to be on me just for a second. Up in the balcony, all over. All over this building. There is a envelope. Now, I don't want anybody... Unless you got unless you got to slip out, I, I want everybody. I want everybody. If you look in the if you look in the seat, if you look in the pew in front of them, there is an envelope. If you don't already have one, I already brought mine with me. If you're a regular tither and giver to Aaron Lake Baptist Church, you probably already have some of these. But I brought mine with you. I want everybody to take an envelope right now. This is our Lottie Moon envelope. I believe there are 1.7 billion people. Listen to me. 1.7 billion people in this world that have never even heard the name of Jesus. And that's not God's fault. Because he commissioned you and me to go into the world and let the world know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God that takes away the sin of the world. I'd like for everybody to grab one of those envelopes. If you've already been praying, maybe you already have your envelope filled out. I already have my envelope filled out. My wife and I have been praying, as we do every year, about what to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And if you're here today and you're not prepared to give anything, I still want you to grab an envelope because I want everybody to persist, participate, all in the balcony, everywhere. Even if you're not giving today and you bring an empty envelope, that's okay. When you come by, when you come by this little manger that we have, when you drop your envelope in, will you do this? Would you say, I don't have anything to give, but I will pray. I'll pray for our missionaries. I'll lift them up before the Lord. Those that are risking their lives all over the world for Jesus, I'll pray for them. You can do that. And if you're here today and maybe you're not prepared to give, you can give online. You can go to our website. And you can give online, and you can designate your Lottie Moon. Not your tithe and offering, not, not your tithe. But you can, you can designate an offering to Lottie Moon if you want to, if you weren't able to give today. But all over this building, I want, whether you have a full envelope or a check in the envelope or some money in that envelope or just a blank envelope, it doesn't matter. How many of you know everybody deserves to hear the gospel at least once in their life? So those in the, in the main auditorium, I hope you guys are standing. I hope you take an envelope. And I'm going to pray. And we're not going to do this organized. You just come. And I'd like for everybody to come. And we've got a pretty full house here at this 930 service, uh, We even way up in the balcony. But I want everybody to come. And those at, at, nine, at, at 1111 in the auditorium, I want you guys to come. And just come by. And as you drop your envelope in, as you drop your money in, as you drop your prayer envelope in, say, Jesus, the world needs to hear. I hope you'll do it. I pray you'll do it.